And welcome to the barn. Um, a special welcome to those who've joined us online. Welcome. Um, just some ground rules again. If, can we please keep our mask on throughout the service? Um, up until you get in your car, you can take it off. Okay. Um, so let's just uh, abide to those rulings. Okay. Um, this morning we are grateful. Grateful for a new day. We are thankful because we are on the other side of the grave. And God has given us life. So let's celebrate that this morning. Let's worship together and give God all the praise he deserves. Amen. I feel you move through me and it's here where you make wrong things right. Your spirit opens my eyes and my heart comes alive and it's your love bringing me to life. Sing this joy, this joy. of life we are grateful and thank you Lord thankful for, for everything that you've done for everything that you are going to do we are praising you in advance right now Lord we thank you in advance bless your name Jesus
wanting a place to hide this weary soul, this bag of bones. And I tried with all my mind, but I just can't win the fight. I'm slowly drifting, a vagabond. And just when I to a place of worship where you can worship Him freely, where you can praise Him freely. Amen? So sing with us. Here we go. Get up, get up, get up. Get up out of that grave. Get up, get up, get up. Get up out of that grave. Sing it again. Get up, get up, get up. Get up out of that grave. Get up, get up, get up. Get up out. One more time. Say get up, get up, get up. Get up out of that grave. I thank the 
you took us Lord from death to life from the miry clay Father God you shaped us and you mold us and you gave us new life and in return Lord we just want to lay down our lives and say thank you thank you for who you are thank you for giving us life hallelujah 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 thank you Lord Hearts 
hearts, Lord. Nothing, Lord, that we have belongs to us. Everything that we are, everything that we own belongs to you. Thank you, Lord. It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise. We pour out our praise. It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise to only. It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out your breath in our lungs so we pour out our praise to you only Amen. I love some of the songs that we are singing about broken hearts that have been healed. You know, the Lord just gave me a thought this, as we were worshiping, and I was thinking about my garage, and I think of all the tools that I've got there. And then I thought, you know, there's no reason why something should remain broken in my house because I've got the tools to fix them. I want you to get my drift this morning. We have all the tools in God's Word and in His Spirit to fix and be fixed and not to remain broken. So when we sing songs like this, I hope that some of it is past tense. Not always having the broken heart, the broken spirit, the broken this and, and issues that some of it is past tense that we're singing from a position of victory, not a position of pain. And if you remain in the pain, I tell you something. Go to your garage. All the tools are there. All the tools are there. Nothing should remain broken. That's just a message I felt God is laying us on. Some of us are just enjoying the brokenness. And that's not joy. That's really not joy. That's not fun at all. So Father, I pray as we sing these songs that we will sing songs of being free by the rivers of Babylon. I remember that song many years ago. That we remember, we remember the past that was broken and painful, but we rejoice because you've brought restoration and hope and joy into our lives. We're not the people we were, so we, we used to be, but we may not be the people that you want us to be yet, but there's been progress, there has been change. Thank you, Lord. But we are not the same. Thank you that we have all the tools in your word and in your spirit to have healthy marriages healthy relationships with our children and with our church family. That we have all the tools to live lives not always on being broke. We love you this morning for the restoration and the joy that you have brought into our lives and the change that you have brought into our lives. We thank you that there's been progress. We thank you for that, Lord. word with you from Psalm 27. You, you can uh, take your seats, please. From uh, Psalm 27, it says, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Then it goes on and it says, For in the day of trouble, he will keep me safe in his dwelling. He will hide me in the shelter of his sacred tent and set me high on a rock. I will remain confident of this, that I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and take heart and wait for the Lord. To me, that is just so important. That is our confidence. God is our strength. Amen. We just want to say welcome to those that are watching online as well. And uh, if we have any visitors with us today, please, won't you just put up your hand? 
And let us see where you are, just so the ushers can give you something. Welcome. And over there, yes, welcome. We trust the Lord to just bless you today. We've just got a couple of announcements. Um, tomorrow evening is a discussion evening, and everybody is welcome. You don't have to be married or engaged. Just come along and join in the discussion uh, to grow in your relationships. And then next Monday night is our AGM. In your bulletin, you'll see all these announcements. Um, please take note of them and come along. Put it on your fridge. So remind yourself about these meetings. And next Saturday, there's competition between the men and the women to see who gets the most people coming. So ladies, next Saturday is our Fearless Women's Breakfast. And it's going to be at Hukuna Matata. Please book online and join us, okay? Good. That's a challenge. <laughs> Always like a challenge, you know, especially when it's sprung on you like that. So uh, come on, ladies, try and outdo us. I think we're at 50 at the men's breakfast. Let's see if you can do any better than that. All right, the youth are selling uh, cool rings after the service, so uh, please uh, support them. Uh, these fundraisers are important to them as well. And uh, as Carol said, it's really nice to see you, you guys coming back, uh, visitors coming to our church as well, and uh, we really hope and trust that you'll find a spiritual home here uh, you know, we are real people serving an awesome God, making an eternal impact. That's, that's what we want to do. You know, we are nothing that special, but we have a God that is that special. And uh, we want to serve Him with all our hearts. So those of you who are here for the first time, straight after the service, we want to just have a cup of coffee with you, quick, quick, just to meet with you. So I'm going to ask some of our pastors to be there as well, uh, just to introduce ourselves to you as well. And if you're online and you are visiting us for the first time, there is a link you can follow. We would love you to just uh, uh, fill that in and we'd like to make contact with you as well. So uh, awesome and it's good to be in God's house, whether you are in your lounge or with us today. All right, I want to read a scripture, uh, we're gonna, then we're going to take up the offering, and then I want to bring God's word to you today. Proverbs chapter 10, verse 22 says this, The blessing of the Lord brings wealth, and he adds no trouble to it. Now, I want to just tell you a little bit about that verse, and there's a lot can be said about the, uh, that verse, but it's true that the, the blessing of the Lord, He does bring wealth. He does give us uh, enough for us to enable us to live and to enjoy life, and, and, but let's move on from that. He adds no trouble to it. I want to speak a little bit to, to us today. Because I know what you think when you come to a time of offering. We always say give and, and so on. And it's important. Tithing and, and so on is very important to us. We've got to do that if we want God's blessing on our lives. But listen to what he speaks about the money. It says when God gives you wealth, he does not add trouble to it. What does that mean? Well, let me highlight one or two things. For those of us who do not receive it from the Lord... Wealth brings discontentment because it's never enough. It brings fear. How will I keep it? It brings anxiety. Am I going to lose it? It brings issues with my conscience. Did I get it the right way? It brings abuse. Well, I've got to step over a few people to get what I want. And it also brings a grief when I lose it. It means so much to me. But when I get it from the Lord, the opposites are true. And I don't want to mention all of that as well. But when God gives us the wealth, it does come with peace. It does come with joy. There is no grief when I lose it. Because it belongs to the Lord anyway. And then obviously, it opens my heart to generosity. And I think that for me is just the opposite. So the blessing of the Lord brings wealth. And he adds no trouble to it. So I trust that as we give to the Lord today that we would just remember those few words as well. Tithing and giving is important, not because we want to keep the wheels ro rolling here at church, but we are giving church as well. In our second service, we're having the pastors from Mozambique coming, and we've just donated something big to them as well. So uh, they're coming to just share, in the, just, just visit us in the service as well. We're a giving church. 
and we want to remain that way as well. So I'm going to ask the ushers to come forward, and we're going to give unto the Lord this morning. Father, I thank you for every person today. I thank you for your blessing on our lives. You are, have blessed us all different and in different ways. And we just want to acknowledge that today. What we have and who we are, we receive out of your hands. And we thank you that the peace that comes with it. And I just ask you today that you would bless every individual, every family in their obedience to you. In Jesus' name. We're speaking about the parables of Jesus, and uh, I want to raise uh, the last parable with you this morning. And we've only, we touched on four, I think, over the last couple of weeks, so this is the fourth one. And so the parable really that I want to highlight this morning is the parable of the net, casting your net. Now, if you, if, you, if you were here all four services or listened to it, you will see that a few of them have related to us reaching out to the unbelievers. And it seems like Jesus really had a deep concern with us reaching those who do not have faith or those who have fallen away from their faith. And that is what Bryce emphasized last week as well, that there are 99 of us maybe right with God, but that one that's missing, and God says, go after them and reach them as well. So today we're speaking about casting your net. Now when you and I are speaking about casting your net wider, if you advise somebody to do that, what do you advise them to do? You advise them to explore other possibilities, maybe greater possibilities, maybe the possibility in other friendships. You know, the, the, you know you've got, you're, you're on your own or you've just got one or two, uh, you know, cast your net and your business will grow, your opportunities will come more. Maybe your knowledge will grow by casting your net as well. The, casting your net or, or growing in opportunities could be in sport or anything. But basically what we are saying to people is broaden your horizon by casting your net. In other words, we're looking for increase when we speak about casting that net. So when I say to you this morning, I want you to cast your net, I'm encouraging you to look for better opportunities. Now Jesus used on two occasions the parable of the net, or he spoke about the net, and they are different but have similarities. And I'm just going to speak about one of them this morning, and that's the one found in Matthew chapter 13, verse 47 to 50. If you want to turn there with me in your Bible or on your cell phone or whatever method you use to read your Bible. The parable of the net is the heading in my Bible. It says in verse 47 of Matthew 13, once again, the kingdom of God, a kingdom of heaven is like a net that was let down into the lake and caught all kinds of fish. When it was full, the fishermen pulled it up onto the shore and then they sat down and collected the good fish in baskets and threw the bad fish away. Now up to, up to there is, is, is kind of good news, but it gets now a little bit more intense. This is how it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come and separate the wicked from the righteous and throw them into a blazing furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So it ends with quite an intense couple of lines. You see, when I look at the Lord Jesus Christ and his lifestyle, it is a little bit different to what you and I are used to. We are taught often to stay away from sinners. And to not mix with them. 
But Jesus had a name and he was criticized by the religious leaders of the day. And they blamed him for the lack of discernment because he loved going out and associate with people that the religious leaders did not want to associate with. You see, Jesus, in his circle of friendships or in circle of influence, there were tax collectors, there was a demon-possessed woman, there were prostitutes, and so on as well. And that was his circle of influence. Maybe not his circle of friendship, but definitely he went out and influenced those kind of people because he wanted to reach them. He spent a lot of time socializing with the tax collectors and sinners. And it gave him a reputation, as you and I have read in the Bible as well, that he is a glutton and a drunk. And I don't think any of these he did. But the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the religious leaders and teachers of the day, did not understand that Jesus was not doing anything impure while he was doing it, while he was associating in their view with the low lives. He was Israel's shepherd, and the Bible says he is going out to reach the lost sheep. You see, the religious leaders were hung up. Because they wanted him to maintain the appearance of purity. But Jesus had his mission in mind. To reach the lost sheep of Israel. And I want us to get the balance as unbelievers as well. As believers today, my friends. Because I think we're not mixing enough with unbelievers. And I'm not saying we should move in those friendship circles and and be sucked into those friendships. But unless we engage with them, they will not hear the good news. And I think you and I should be open to be blamed. To, uh, to, to, uh, uh, you know, blamed as people who mix with those kind rather than people who withdraw and forget the mission. So it says here, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was laid down in a lake and caught all kinds of fish. All kinds of fish. Now I want to talk a little bit about this parable, and, and, and I'm always amazed when Jesus taught my friends that it was not something so difficult that we could not get hold of it, and that we needed an interpretation from some kind of an intellectual person to say, what does he really mean? Sometimes it was so simple that the disciples said, huh, is that what he really means, or what do you mean? Now, the casting of the net is a very simple thing that Jesus encourages us as his disciples to do. It's very similar to the parable of the weeds, where the farmers planted their seeds, and then secretly the enemy went out and planted weeds among the crop. And then the servants came to the farmer and said, what do you want us to do? Do you want us to to de-weed? And he says, no, leave it, because the harvest will separate the two. The harvest will separate the two. You see, the master tells them not to worry about the weeds so much. Because if you water the seed enough, it will outgrow the weeds. You see, my friend, there will be a time where valuable grain and worthless weed will be separated. And that's basically what this parable is highlighting as well. So Jesus speaks to his disciples, and we have seen in the last few parables, as as I've said, that these parables describe what the kingdom of God is like, or should be like. So in this parable, he speaks about a net, but this is not any kind of net. Now, I've used all kinds of stuff when I fished, but I've never used a drag net. But I've seen how they use a dragnet. When we were in Thailand, Carol, I don't know if you remember, that they used to go out with their little boats, and then you would see them drop the one end of the net, and they would row a couple of hundred meters to the left or to the right, whichever way they were going, and they would drop that net. And I'll tell you just now how it works. 
But that net was a massive, it was a span of a couple of hundred meters. And they would leave it there normally overnight. And early in the morning, you would see that same fisherman. And they would go, one on this end of the net, or a few of them, and a few on that end of the net. And they would first pull those drag nets in towards the beach, and eventually towards one another. And you would see them pull that net. And when it was full of fish, they needed a team. To drag those fish in. A large net. That is a drag net. You see some of the nets that we use when we fish for carp or when we fish for for trout is a single net, a small net, and you scoop one fish at a time. Here Jesus is saying, go for the masses. Go for the multitudes. Go for numbers, he says. Go for as many as you can find. So the fisherman's job is cast out the net and scoop it in, bring it back in, scooping all the fish in this drag net, bringing the good and the bad onto shore. You see, so the same, in the same way Jesus says, one day the angels are going to sit down and I'll highlight a little bit uh, 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 what, what some of these things mean a little bit later in my sermon. And he says, the angels are going to sit down. The angels are going to sit down. And not you and me, the angels are going to sit down. And they're going to separate the wicked and the righteous. And I want to explain to you in a moment what that means as well. But the picture here is first of these guys bringing in all the fish. And then they would sit there. And they would sort out the good and the bad fish. Now a bad fish normally relates to fish that are not edible, not good for human consumption. Maybe it's not something that they could sell. Because that's what some of the fishermen did, is they would sell it to vendors, and then the vendors would go and sell it or resell it to those on the market as well. And the good fish would obviously be the opposite, the edible the good for human consumption, that which brings a profit to the fishermen. So they would separate these two fish. The ones that are good, they would keep, and the bad fish, they would throw back into the sea. They won't be able to sell it. So how do we interpret this parable, and how does it apply to you and me today? Let me tell you something as I start our thinking on this parable. True fact In New Orleans, many years ago, 200 people gathered together to celebrate a season when no one drowned. The first time ever, no one drowned in their public pool. And of all the people that met there, of the 200 plus people, at least 100 people were certified lifesavers, lifeguards. And among those four, uh, those 100 certified lifeguards, there were four that were on duty that day when lifeguards and people like-minded were celebrating the fact that that season no one was lost, no one died, no one drowned. The party was finishing up. And uh, as the celebration started to end, and the party is over, some of these lifeguards, these four, they moved around the pool and they found in the deep end of the pool, the 30-year, one-year-old Jeremy Moody dead on the bottom of the deep end of the pool, drowned in front of them on their watch while they were celebrating. You can read some of the stuff because it's a fact of how they felt. They pulled him out. They tried to revive him. They got emer- emergency medical attendants who arrived, but the autopsy confirmed that Jeremy drowned. My friend, that tells me a little bit of a story about the church today. While we celebrate our salvation, while we celebrate the fact that Jesus is Lord of my life, while it's lacquer to get together like this, there are people that are drowning While the lifeguards, point to ourselves, while the lifeguards are celebrating. That's a serious story for you and me today. Because we've got to cast our net. That's what the Bible tells us. And Bryce highlighted the fact that most of us, more than 90 something percent of us, will never share our faith with anybody. 
You see, right now, my dear friends, I think we are living in a time like never before where the Lord's example and the Lord's command to cast our net as widely as possible must be taken seriously. You see, this is not just a small net. It is a drag net. In other words, this dragnet uses every possible opportunity to get out there, to send out invitations, crusades, events, dedications, baptisms, whatever way we find it possible, bry at our home, discovery groups or whatever you want to invite people to come and hear the good news, the message of the kingdom of God and not just to gain more knowledge and education. You see, now is not the time for you and me to decide who is in and who is out. It's not my job. It's not your job to decide who's in, who's out, because we don't have that ability. Our job, my friend, and it's a simple message we are bringing to you the last few weeks, our job is to issue invitations. That's our job. Not who's right, who's ready, who's the weed, who's the wheat. Who's going to make it? Who's not going to make it? Do they smell good? Do they look good? Will they fit in? It is to cast the net as wide as possible. It is obvious. It is obvious that people claim to know the Lord Jesus Christ and they actually don't. It is obvious that there are people who are even fellowshipping with us on a regular basis who could be wheat among us who maybe have not understood the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. But you see, the kingdom is going to draw the insincere and the sincere. You see, when we cast that net, we are drawing people from all kinds, good and bad fish. The good news, at least, if people come with you to church and they sit here and they listen, but they haven't responded, or not yet, that they are hearing and are exposed to the message, and the possibility is much greater for it to reach into their hearts because they're hearing the good news. But if we don't invite them, if we don't speak to them, you see, if you're online today and you're watching us, you have a phenomenal opportunity because next week Sunday is plus one service. And what we aim to do is that each one of us would bring an unbeliever to church today, that day. And it's much easier as well when you're home. You can do a bri, and you can invite people at your home and say, we're going we're gonna to just watch something live today. It's just going to take us half an hour. You can leave the worship out as you, if you want and just play the sermon or the other way around and spread the good news. It is not our job to judge who's going to make it or not. The Bible says the angels are going to do that in the end. I want to remind you today, listen to me. Our job is not to clean the fish. Our job is to catch the fish. That's our job, is to catch the fish. God will sort them. God will clean them. But you and I are the fishermen. We are here and we should be casting the invitations and we should be casting the net. I don't have to remind you that we're living in an evil world. I just read yesterday that there's persecution, the first time ever, of believers in Finland. Let me tell you, I do think we're living in end times where it's going to become more and more difficult for believers to live out their faith. There's evil all around. And we can lose sometimes our perspective on the job that we have. And we start focusing on the evil in the world instead of casting the net and reaching. Reaching out to those who don't know the Lord Jesus Christ. My dear friend, I want to say it in different words to you today. But let me say it today. On judgment day, it's not you and I that's going to be the judge and the jury. That's not our job. Because we are fallible. You know, if I point a finger to somebody, they can point something, a finger back to me. I'm here to spread the good news and the change that God has brought into my life. It is God who will judge the motives of our hearts and what we have done as well. All I've got to do as a believer is remain obedient to the message that the Lord Jesus has laid on our hearts. 
What Jesus is trying to show us through this parable is that we've got to use this dragnet which goes out into the whole world. Now, my dear friends, I do fish, and I, I, I like all kinds of different fishing. I, I like carp fishing, and you put a specific bait on there, and, and it's not 100 hooks, but you've maybe got a maximum of two hooks, and you cast it out there, and you've got all kinds of smells and stuff that people are these days putting in to, onto the bait, and it's supposed to work, and, and I remember the days when I just used custard and, and curry powder on white bread, and it also caught fish, but now it's changed. Fish have changed. Fish have changed. they become very intellectual. But if I catch a trout... I have a specific hook that I use. If I catch a yellow fish, a very specific hook that I use. If I want to catch a barbel, a worm, or a, a piece of chicken liver, it's a good idea. And the more rotten it is, the better it is. And then we went to New Zealand, and I watched for the first time people fishing with a torpedo. Now, our seas won't handle it because our seas are too up and down. The waves are too big. And they send out this torpedo. And as you send out the torpedo, before you send it out, you, you've got uh, 100 hooks if you want. And on each hook, you've put a, a bait. And you just send it out there straight on for a couple of hundred, sometimes two, three kilometers. And the torpedo lies out there. And all these hooks are lying in the water. And then you leave it there for an hour or two. And you put that thing in reverse. And it brings that torpedo back. And sometimes you can catch a lot of fish that's closer to the net. That's closer to the net. Jesus says, cast the net. You know, I am so concerned about doing it right. I, I, I'm so concerned about being retrained and retrained and retrained about how to share my faith. We are so concerned about having the right lights and the seats and, the, and the, this and that and so on. And I like all of this stuff. I, 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 I'm not dissing it. But we are so, right to, so, so concerned about how my pastor dresses or, or what he looks like in the front there. Or, or does, he, does he put gel in his hair and wear tight pants or whatever and, 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 and some sm fancy shoes or whatever. You know, because that will reach the last. That will never reach the last. Cast the net, Jesus says. You know, there's no bait in the net. Not even. It's just casting a net. That's the word of God. It's just cast the word of God. And be less concerned about the how-tos. Because I believe, my dear friend, when a fish is hungry enough, they'll take anything. And I don't mean just anything. I mean, the, doesn't, they are not so concerned about how it's presented. They want the bait. It's a beautiful picture, this. Cast your net. It is an amazing picture. Cast your net because bring in whoever wants to respond. And yet so few of us are doing it. But the picture gets a little bit ugly, as I said here as well. Because listen to what it says. There's a scary aspect of the story that Jesus is sharing with us. And, and it's the, the aspect of bad and good fish in the same net. Here's the question. What is a bad fish? The second question is, is hell even literal? Now, you know, they do surveys among Christians today, and the majority of Christians do not believe that hell is a real place. Well, I'm, I'm sorry to tell you that regardless of the popularity of some of these theories and stories, Jesus spoke more about a literal, fearful hell than he did about heaven. Go and study your Bible. He said it's real. And I base my faith on what Jesus says and not about what other people think because not all are going to go into the presence of God one day, unfortunately. You see, I suppose the reason he talked about this because he knows and he knew good and he also knew that evil exists. And he knew that those who were good fish will spend eternity with him. And the opposite is that those who do not, they will spend eternity in a place called hell. And the good news is that Jesus says, that's why I'm going, to tell them the good news, to liberate them and free them and save them so that they can tell others as well. Let's get back to the question. Let's bring it back to my own heart this morning. Am I a good fish? Or a bad fish? Where am I going? Would he consider me a good fish? 
That's the question. You see, it can get pretty dicey when we start asking these questions because Jesus says this, listen to this. He will separate the wicked and the righteous. Now, who wants to be called wicked this morning? Not many of us. It is just as tough to call myself righteous. So yet I am, and I'm sitting with this dilemma. So what does wicked and what does righteous really mean? Simply this. The wicked are the guilty ones. The righteous are the ones that are innocent. And that's how simple it is. So Jesus says he will judge, he will separate. The angels are going to separate between the wicked and the righteous, the guilty and the innocent. And you and I know how I have become innocent. Not because of my work. Not because of what I've done, but because of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because the reality of the story is that we're all guilty. Even if it's just a little bit. Even if if you're not so bad, but you still have a little tantrum when somebody takes your TV remote. Or you show a little bit of selfishness when it comes to this is mine. Like when you were two years old. Even Even if you've just taken a pen that doesn't belong to you at work. You're a thief. So how do I become innocent? And you and I know this story. And I want us to rejoice this morning. I have become innocent not because of the work that I have done. Not because I have done anything, but because of what the Word of God says. Second Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21 says this. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him We get to become the righteousness of God. That's it. He took my sin and I became righteous because of my faith in him. I hope you see it. Let me tell you something. You and I have got the habit of separating. We separate people. There are those of us who vote for the ANC and they separate it from those who watch, vote for the DNA and they separate it from those who, watch, who vote for the ACDP. There's those we are separated by neighborhoods. Yesterday we went for a walk somewhere and as we're driving, we drove probably through three or four neighborhoods and you could see the difference in these different neighborhoods. We are separated. I live in that neighborhood, you in this one, and I think mine is better, and you think yours is is better, and so on. We are separated by people by where we grew up. You know, I often say that my wife grew up in the bluff, on the bluff in Durban. It got a lot better after that when she married me. It got a lot better after that, a lot better. I took her out the bluff there, you know, made a woman out of a... Uh, you know, and so on, brought it here to, you know, and so on. But we separated by where we live, where we grew up. We separated by I'm a male and a female. Hierarchies separate us. Employment can separate us. Rich and poor can separate us. Genders and race separate us as well. Jesus doesn't do that. But one day he will separate the wicked and the righteous. That's what he's going to do. That's the separation. That's the, what he's going to do one day. Those who are forgiven, those who are not innocent. Innocent and not innocent. That's the issue here. Nothing else. Not who you voted for, not where you lived, not your race, not your gender. Righteous or wicked. That's how he's going to separate us one day. My dear friends, if we understand this message, it is so serious. I hope we will take our mission much more serious as well. Jesus tells us, and he told his disciples as well, I will make you fishers of men. Now, here he goes to the guys, and he tells them, and there's another story for another time, cast your net out here, and they said, oh, we've got nothing all night, all day long, night long, and we're tired now. And he says, no, no, go out to the deep. Cast it once more. And they brought out a net full of fish, and they were so amazed. And P- uh, Jesus says, and it's rule of paraphrase, and he looks at Peter and he says, you think that's great? You think, you, you think that's amazing? You're going to make a couple of bob out of this uh, when, when it's daylight, China. But let me tell you something. I'm going to make you a fisher of men. And you're going to lead people into eternity, into the glorious presence of God. And people, Peter probably says, that sounds cool, but huh? 
What do you mean by that? And he says, follow me. Follow me because I'm going to make you one of those. How long have we followed Jesus? And we have not yet become a fisher of men. There's a story, and I want to end with this. I don't know if you've done history at school. I did. The little ships of Dunkirk. Does anybody, does it ring a bell? Anybody who's read uh, history? There's 850 private boats in a time of war. Hitler annihilating his enemies, one after the other. Few allies get together. 360 plus thousand soldiers are stranded in, on France, on, in France on the beaches. Can't get to the warships. Can't be, get back to their home, their destinies. France or England, they stranded. Hitler sends a message out and says, I'm going to wipe them all out. The army can do nothing. We're talking about 1940. The ships are far out. The water is not deep enough for the ships to come in, but too deep for the soldiers to get there. And some of these men for hours and hours of standing in water this deep, waiting to be rescued by the warships that cannot do it. Message gets back home in England. And 850 private boats, fishing boats, leisure boats, patrol boats, just normal little boats, sails from Ramsgate in England to Dunkirk in the northern part of France on a journey. And on the 26th of May until the 4th of June, the Operation Dynamo, and they rescued more than 336,000 soldiers by simply taking them from the beach a couple of hundred meters deep into the sea to the rescue ships, to the army ships. Because they were trapped. They saved their lives. Let me tell you something about these soldiers. They didn't care whose boat came to fetch them. They didn't care what that boat looked like, Mike. They didn't care what the sails looked like. They didn't care who the sailor was. Nothing. Presentation didn't count here. The fact was, a rescue boat is here. I'm getting in. I'm getting in. It was amazing. It was amazing. Here, 220 warships could do nothing. And 850 normal guys, sailors, normal citizens rescued 360,000 of these men. Churchill is so excited. And in the House of Commons, he gets up in his famous speech and he says, we shall go on to the end. We shall fight in France. We shall fight on the seas and the oceans. We shall fight with growing confidence and growing strength in the air. We shall defend our island, whatever the cost may be. We shall fight on the beaches. We shall fight on the landing grounds. We shall fight in the fields and in the streets. We shall fight on the hills. We shall never surrender. One of the most famous speeches of Churchill, this excited the whole nation. To stay committed to a war where commoners, not soldiers, came to the rescue of soldiers. There's a story here for you and me as well. Many are stuck on the islands and they need to be rescued. Many. They're not going to care so much about your presentation, they're going to care that you have a lifeboat, that you have the message. You say, I'm not good enough. You are, because you're a believer. I don't know what to say. The Holy Spirit says he will lead you to say. Get out and cast the net is the job that we are called to do. I don't know if you remember, last week Bryce did the one-minute witness tool with us. I want to highlight it quickly again by simply saying this. The one-minute witness tool is one of the simplest ways of speaking to somebody about the gospel. Permission. You ask a question. What is the best thing that ever happened to you? They share with you. Then you ask permission to share your best thing that ever happened to you. You can say, instead of the best thing, you can say, what is the most meaningful thing? That has ever happened to you. You can ask a question like, if you die tonight, where do you think you would go? And if you do go to heaven, why do you think you should go to heaven? 
May I tell you what the Bible says about heaven? You see, those are kind of stuff that you and I can use. And then, you, in, this is one minute. You pick three, three words that describe yourself before Jesus. BC days. I was insecure without purpose and f- uh, suffering with feelings of rejection. Turning point. The day I realized that Jesus died for my sins, there's a turning point in my life. And he changed all of those things around. That's the AD, after my faith. Since I gave my life to Jesus, I now know that I'm saved. I now know that I have a purpose. I feel accepted. The feelings of rejection is gone. If I never met Jesus, the fourth point there, I think, or the fifth one, I think my life could have really been a wreck. I think that I would have destroyed many lives as well. I think that I would have been a super selfish person. Thank you for listening. Any questions? And if the door is open, my friend, let me tell you, so what about you? And then you can ask some of those questions. And then you can share the ABC of your faith. You see, too many of us say, Rolf, I don't have the tools. Well, from this Sunday and next Sunday, we'll practice it every Sunday. I'll call somebody forward and we'll say, this is, this is how you do it. What is the ABC of my faith? I'm going to repeat it until you either don't come to church or start doing it. What is the ABC of faith? Admit that you have done wrong. Believe that Jesus died for your sin. Confess that you have sinned. And then confess him with your your mouth. And then share it. A, B, C. Okay? Let me ask you, if you're sitting here today, or maybe you're online with us, and you say, I don't know Jesus as Lord and Savior, but you made it quite simple to me now and clear to me. Then I want to ask you to pray with us in a moment. And as I pray this prayer live here today, that you would just go there and say, there would be a slide pop on now that you could say, ready, and we will contact you as well. But if you're sitting with us, my friend, and you're not ready, I'm casting the net today and saying, I trust that you would hear the words of God. Come. Come. Come and lay down your life here, your burdens here, your sinfulness here, and I will cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Come and confess, because I will make you pure and righteous. So when that net is cast, you'll hear these words. Come into my kingdom. I've got a place prepared for you. You see, friend, if you've never done that, if you've never given your life to Christ, if you've never prayed just a simple prayer as Lord Jesus, I surrender. I confess that I'm a sinner. I believe you are the son of God. I turn from my sin today. If you've never done that, I'm thankful that you're sitting here, maybe listening at home. But you could be the bad fish, and it can change for you today. If you're saying, Rulo, that makes sense, I would like you to pray for me. Won't you just stand? Did anybody today say, I, I'm not, I'm, <laughs> I don't see myself as that good fish yet. Won't you just stand, and let me pray for you. Be bold enough and say, Rulo, that's me, man. I'm not right with God. Thank you so much. Just remain standing. Anybody else and say, Rulo, I'm not right with God. Thank you so much. I'm so glad you're bold. Anybody else? Just stand quickly. I would like to close in prayer. And if you're at home, you're doing it right now, maybe just click now and saying, I'm ready, or write to us. Anybody else? Just remain standing for a second. Okay? I want to pray with you, but then I would like you to go through to the prayer lounge. Don't go home before we have taken you through these simple steps. It's simple, life-transforming. It is, it can It changes your destiny by just saying, I, ABC, I admit, I believe, I confess, and give your life to Christ today. I'm going to pray for you. Maybe you're sitting here and say, I should stand, but I'm a little bit scum, a little bit shy, but just go through to the prayer lounge after I prayed. Father, I pray for those who are standing in Jesus' name. I thank you that you're a merciful, merciful, loving, kind God. The fact is you spread that net out so wide. You want all to come to faith. And I pray that those who are in the net today who may not be righteous yet would hear your voice today and say, come, come. I pray for that now in Jesus' name. That as we spend a few minutes together, that this would sink deep into their hearts. 
forgiven, cleansed from all unrighteousness. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Won't you guys just go through to the prayer lines? We would like to chat to, to you, uh, one, of, one or two of our pastors. The rest, if you're a visitor, we'd love to meet you at the coffee um, station there. One of these days we'll have real coffee, I promise you. And uh, we'd like to meet with you and just greet you there as well. Have an absolutely awesome day. And please don't forget, plus one Sunday, cast your net, bring them in. God bless you. Have a, have a good week.